Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Fagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Arif Hassan. Arif, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, we had a um, bit of like a crock pot like cook off today at uh, at work because it's so cold that we needed to like have as much comfort f- food as like humanly possible. Right. And, wow, you were built for this, man. Oh, Wait, oh like yeah. Five this... years in Norse code training for this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I'd never uh, I'd never made my queso for uh, for for the people at work before. Oh, your famous queso. My my world famous queso. So um, yeah, uh, people were almost licking like the, t- licking the um, licking like the crock pot like bowl part after that. Like it was it was gone. There was. Nothing left. I was, and really, that's the best feeling you can possibly have at like a potluck sort of thing. Is that there is nothing left for you to take home? It's like right on. Yeah, that's that's winning right there. <laughs> exactly. That's that's as close to winning as I'm going to get this weekend. For, since the Vikings are playing the Patriots, so I'm uh, I'm I'm just taking my victory. Just just taking my nice little well, victory lap. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little negative, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, but first, want to thank you guys for uh, for listening. Welcome to the show. Uh, we have a bunch of great stuff to go over. We have the Patriots game. We're going to be previewing that with a special guest. And we have a pretty good mailbag. So uh, just going to want to thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, we do have a donation to uh, to briefly mention, a fantastic donation. Really super appreciate it. Uh, donation from Brian Lopez. Uh, Brian says, love the podcast and want to keep it uh, ad-free. Arif is excellent. James is a great host in an unsung role. I just wanted to do a bit of a dramatic <laughs> read there. It's well produced and reminds me of home. Wonderf- uh, wonderfully discursive, uh, autodidactic, uh, smart, refreshingly small town. Um, yeah, I look forward to it every week. Uh, thank you again, Brian Lopez. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we, As we had mentioned, we are not doing ads on the show. So if you would like to donate to the show, you can do so in one of two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse code, or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code and donate there. Obviously, PayPal is a one-time donation, and Patreon is more of a subscription-based uh, service. Once again, if you would like to get the, uh, the additional Christmas episode, you need to subscribe to Patreon by November 30th. Uh, so Friday, <laughs> you need to put that in by Friday. So uh, all of that aside, we have a fantastic show and we are going to just dive right in with uh, with a special interview with, uh, with Brian Phillips. And as promised, we have a special interview here uh, to help preview the Pats game. We have brought on uh, Brian Phillips. You may know him through his work at uh, Pats Pulpit, the uh, SB Nation blog for the uh, New, e- New England Patriots. On Twitter, he is uh, bphelps underscore SB. Uh, Brian, welcome to the show. How you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I'm doing, doing fantastic. Looking forward to Sunday's game. Excellent. Uh, so before we start, uh, let's just go a little bit uh, on your background, and then uh, Arif's going to talk more about the game. Yeah, I mean, I started writing for Pat's Pulpit back in 2016, and uh, I do a lot of uh, basically like features, and uh, I'm a big salary cap nerd, so I do a lot of the contract uh, stuff. Perfect. And yeah, so um, and uh, yeah, I guess they just started uh, bringing me on to do some of the the social work, and uh, we're doing some Facebook Live video stuff uh, this year too. So kind of just uh, you know layering the content hashtag content. Yeah. Yeah, no, we uh, we're we're big fans of purveyors of digital multimedia hashtag content. So glad to have you on, man. <laughs> it's all that's all we're about, really. Uh, yeah, well, let, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the Patriots. I guess that's why why you're here. Um, I guess the first question is: uh, Is Tom Brady like declining? Right, because that's I think been kind of an undercurrent of conversation that I've seen in uh, national media, sort of. Uh, and we had this conversation back in 2013. His numbers tanked, didn't get up until like I think halfway through 2014. And I personally, I thought he was washed then. I thought, you know, the guy at Pro Football Focus, Sam Monson, said the same thing. We ended up being pretty wrong about that. But at some point, you know, he's done. Uh, so is he declining? Uh Short answer, uh, well, this is always so tough, and nothing triggers Pats fans more than this conversation. It's it's my favorite. Um, <laughs> the short yeah, that's answer, why we asked it first. <laughs> <laughs> short answer is uh, yes, um, he is, oh, no. and 
and he, I mean, cause he has to be right. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, if you look at it from like a super meta, like, Hey, aren't we all declining? Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> aren't we all dying? Right. Yeah. Like exactly. But you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, if you just look at it, it the Patriots have, have, have approached the entire Tom Brady, uh, saga the last few years with the expectation that it's it's going to happen any time now uh, and it you know obviously it hasn't up to this point and even this year he's he's playing a slightly above a career average level um obviously his career spans a couple of different eras but right uh, so i mean that that brings up two questions that that i've had um or rather two questions about opinions that i've had um so i'm just going to assert my opinions and yes. then you can like correct me or tell me I'm dumb or wrong. That's the whole point of this. So uh, well, my opinion one is about kind of the historical whatever of Tom Brady. So you mentioned he's above his career average. And of course, that spans a couple of decades. And that uh, goes back to a couple of eras before when 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 numbers were just down overall. So maybe it's not fair. But also, uh, I didn't think he was a very good quarterback until 2006, despite having won several Super Bowls kind of along the way. And I don't want to like diminish individual victories to get there. Like you could say that ah, he set up a, a, a field goal and a win and he ended up being, uh, you know, uh, in the snow, right. And he ended up being, you know, lauded for a 20 or 40, whatever yard drive. But rather, I just want to talk about like, you know, he was perceived as a game manager for a long time who ended up winning a game, uh, that ended up being put in the national spotlight, the Super Bowl, uh, and then it seemed like he didn't put up very spectacular numbers, even compared to the quarterbacks of his era, uh, until, you know, 2005, 2006. And of course, the 2007 season happens with like Moss and all that. Uh, and he ended up being genuinely, undisputably uh, by the numbers, by wins, whatever, a phenomenal quarterback. Is that fair? Am, am I, uh, I, don't think, being... I don't think anything you said there is unfair at all. I think it's all true. And it's all it's that's exactly how I feel about his career. And and um, monster, you're, a patch, you're not supposed <laughs> to say that. Well, see, now, like, see, I'm kind of like the anti hero. Like, I, I you know. Patriots, we all know how Patriots fans get when when we when it comes to these issues, and and I know we're gonna probably tiptoe into the hashtag QB wins conversation here in a little bit, like with this, but like you know, you're absolutely right. Game manager, he was a sixth round pick, developmental guy when he you know when he's in 2001 when he took over after the Mo Lewis hit. That, that's what he was. He was still developing and obviously getting up to NFL speed and, you know, life comes at you fast. But when you've got a defense that they had, you know, in, in that era, um, you can win with it. Obviously, they weren't, like you said, putting up these gaudy numbers. And obviously, when, when you bring in a Randy Moss type guy uh, and Wes Welker, um, you know, obviously things will skyrocket for any uh, above replacement level quarterback. But um, I think we've seen, I think Tom Brady represents the trajectory that kind of uh, that you see with guys like Stefan Diggs, where there it's very rare where you see this like this perpetual progression throughout their whole, like this whole apex, a consistent upward trajectory. And I think the fallacy is that all players do that. And real in reality, very few do. Right. Uh, and, and, and Tom Brady is just, you know, happens to be the most prominent quarter, you know, in, in the most prominent position. Obviously, the championships uh, magnify everything you do. And, you know, the, and the Patriots media, uh, you know, the whole dynasty and everything. So, you know, it's been an in full. Right. Well, it's it, it's full somewhat view. similar to the Joe Montana conversation, right? Because in some of those years that they won the Super Bowl, Joe Montana, und indisputably a great quarterback. Uh, they also had like the number one or number two defense in the NFL, and no one ever really talks about the 49ers defenses of that era. Um, I mean, the Pats have several Hall of Famers on that defense uh, that ended up helping, you know, 01, 03, 05, and so on. Um, I don't know. It's just kind of fascinating. The second question is, I mean, it has to be now that we've talked about, I mean, you mentioned the past several years they've been acting like. So you got to ask about the Seth Wickersham story about the, you know, it, whether or not Brady forced a trade, whether or not Brady has a relationship with Kraft that has interfered with the general managing duties of Bill Belichick, whether or not you think that story is true. Wickersham has generally been a really phenomenal reporter, um, but there is a lot of blowback on 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 this story that uh, they were going to um, tap Jimmy Garoppolo as the quarterback of the future uh, and in, in some sense maybe trade Brady. I don't know, but in some sense prepare for Jimmy to be the guy and to anticipate or prepare for or even hasten uh, the removal of Brady from the organization in some respect. What, what are your thoughts on that story? Oh man, I haven't talked about Jimmy Jimmy Garoppolo in a while. My my son, my love, 
my prince jimmy um prince jimmy that's a good way to put it i mean look at him oh well yeah um he's uh you know it's very clear that they operate you know the, the patriots are operate with an economic you know bill bill with an economics major it's it's part of the lure you know the the whole lore of bill belichick but i mean that's how they operate and and when you have an outlier like tom you know and in, in, in a situation like this you, you're gonna have you're going to have kind of a, a confluence of, of, of narratives, you know, two outcomes happened at the same time for this team. And uh, do I think that some of the Seth Wickersham uh, piece there, I, I think it, all of it stems from a bit of a nugget of truth um, to where, yes, there has to, there's probably some differing opinions on which, which outcome they should go with or, uh, but obviously I think a, a bit of it is hyperbole from maybe, you know, whatever sources Seth had, um, my my problem is, is is the Patriots fans attacking ESPN and attacking Seth and it's unnamed sources and we got to attack unnamed sources with mm-hmm. you know a fury, um, which I, I think is is terrible. Um, I think uh, I, I think the piece was really well done. I think he went with what he had and he wouldn't have done so. Uh, obviously, his background and, and everything Seth wrote before that, all the work he did with Don Van Natta or Don Van Natta. Um, covering the NFL uh, was very, extremely reputable. There's no reason for anybody to doubt that he was getting that information uh, from somebody or multiple people within the organization. But it's just, you know, sometimes your information is either you know extremely correct and, you know, we don't know to what degree it is or right. isn't, obviously. But uh, yeah, I think it definitely stems from a nugget of truth, but, um, but they're all professionals and I don't think there's any animosity in there in the room. Obviously I think they're all, you know, they're professionals. They're, they're going in and getting their job done. Okay. Well, let's get back to the conversation at hand, which is the matchup that the Vikings and the Patriots will have. It just felt like, you know, we wanted to get that out of the way because yeah. pretty compelling sort of, uh, narratives to, to take a look at. Uh, so if Brady is declining and, and the connection is that he is, what does that look like? Is it, is he misdiagnosing plays more often? Is he not going through his progressions as quickly? Is his arm declining? He's never known for having an enormous arm despite that 2007 season. Um, but he's supposed to be like this incredible expert at, at feeling what's happening in the pocket and dissecting defenses and so on. How does the decline materialize? We see the numbers. What does that look like? Yeah, and, and it's 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 in such minute little spots, little little chunks here and there. Um, you know, we see it where uh, the the big the big goal of last week's victory in, in New York was to come out and and, and get up early, get up. You know, you know, you know, go out and establish themselves and take a lead early with the opening drive. Go out and score, and they got a first down, and then they had a third and four, and they had Gronk uh, isoed out on Jamal Adams on the outside, and and Tom's read was just just a hair slower than it normally <laughs> is, and and it led to a, and it led to a, a, a deflection by Jamal Adams and a punt. Uh, these little things, and with 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 the NFL and how football is such a high variance sport, you know, just one punch, and next thing you know, you're down seven, and then you know the, the, you're tied at halftime. Uh, even though they after they got down seven, they won, you know, they 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 played the rest of the game twenty six to to or twenty seven to six. Uh, the narrative is that the Jets, uh, you know, drug the Patriots into a sloppy game. But there's little plays here and there we're seeing from Tom where his read is a little slower. He's feeling pressure a little sooner, like we saw in Tennessee. Right. Uh, that, that, you know, phantom pressure stuff that's not there even. Um, and he's he's been quicker than normal to to discard the football and to, to you know, we, we see, the you know, the ones where he gets where he just he's chucking it into the ground or he's he's throwing it 10, you know, 10 rows deep. We're seeing that a little more often this year. It's interesting. I mean, uh, here in Minnesota, we're right next to Wisconsin. Packers fans are having the same discussion about Aaron Rodgers, you know, chucking balls into the dirt when he shouldn't necessarily be being a little bit slower to the read. Uh, great quarterbacks declining across the NFL at the same time that, you know, Patrick Mahomes and Jared Goff are letting the league on fire. Kind of interesting. Kind of like a monster situation, it's, I guess. It's, it's so it's so interesting. And I still think, you know, there's there's an element of, um, you know, Obviously, Aaron Rodgers has a lot of uh, different targets and different faces he's looking at mm-hmm. this year. Um, the Tom's, you know, getting familiar with Josh Gordon, which we're right. just now starting to see. Um, and you guys will see this weekend, uh, you know, and and he hasn't had Gronk. He's had Gronk in, in, in spurts. Gronk's been in and out of the lineup, obviously, with injuries and stuff. So and, and every and the way that the Patriots operate, the game plan is so different every week that uh that it's tough to get into a rhythm, almost, you know, tough to get into a rhythm, but uh, people are taking this, uh, this, the ground and pound. The Patriots are having a ton of success with Sony Michelle and, and, you know, the, the correlation is there, but it's not necessarily the causation. Uh, 
the games that they're winning, that they're running a ton, uh, they're take, people are taking that as, well, they're trying to take the ball out of Tom's hands, and really they're just playing with the strengths of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and managing the flow of the game, which which the run game is is very good at doing. Okay, um, that's fair. Uh, so uh, when you go up against a defense like the Vikings, which over the past five six weeks have I think kind of revitalized themselves, kind of a a new look defense, um, and uh, and maybe you know not like Chicago or Baltimore is one of the top defenses in the NFL, but certainly a challenging one. Um, what do you anticipate being kind of the biggest challenges? I mean, you mentioned uh, that with a different game plan every week, it's difficult to get everybody on the same page, especially with you know new faces. Um, what do you see as, as maybe the biggest challenges dealing with the Vikings defense? Yes, that's why I'm so excited about this game, because I think we're going to see the other side of the coin on, on that uh, Patriots game plan. Because I, I wrote I wrote a couple of days or yesterday, in fact, uh, about how the game plan is going to have to be just vastly different against against you guys, against Minnesota, than it was against uh, against New York. It was clear against New York that um, Mike Pinnell and, and Leonard Williams and Steve McClendon were getting bossed around inside. Uh, the Patriots interior offensive line had their best game of the year, um, uh, career highs in rushing totals for, for James White and Sonny Michelle last week. That's not going to happen against uh, – uh, basically, my piece was a, a Linval Joseph fanboy piece, is what it, ended up, <laughs> it turned out to be. Well, I, mean, I don't hate I, I that. Think- I, th- I think Linval Joseph is the best run-stopping interior defensive lineman in football, and he's the reason I can't stand Pro Bowl voting. Um, last year, I think he, right. he got in eventually, but he wasn't originally voted in. I believe, right? right? Yeah. Um, which is just uh, ridiculous to me. I, I think I think his presence and then Sheldon Richardson, uh, you're just not going to be able to get the push um, that you want. I mean, I mean, both of those guys can, you know, you, you try to run traps on, on the inside with those guys and they, they blow everything up. Uh, it, it's just not going to happen. I think they're going to have to, I think we're going to see a lot of five wide, um, a lot of 10 personnel uh, with James white outside and trying to get after that cornerback depth with uh, obviously with some injuries you guys have sustained uh, in the secondary this year uh, and try to spread everybody out and, and make you guys cover every inch of the field because getting into a box against guys like Linval Joseph and, you know, letting, you know, Eric Hendricks and Anthony Barr running around, just making plays all over the place. It, it sounds like a recipe for disaster for New England. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about some of those individual matchups. then. so first I think, uh, I mean, we're already on the conversation about Linval. You obviously, you have the correct opinion on that. Uh, <laughs> but you know, let's, let's talk about this, uh, this offensive line. So the Patriots, uh, have consistently, I mean, uh, uh, they've had great offensive line coaching over the past uh, decade and a half. I mean, obviously, uh, um, Skarniecki, you know, took a break for a little bit, and the offensive line dipped. Um, Ooh, but boy, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, dipped is maybe generous. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's a bunch of names that I think people aren't as familiar with, or excited. it's not like you know we've got um, you know uh, the the Pro Bowlers of the past that you know have gone to like the Buccaneers. Some of them are still hanging around the NFL. But uh, some interesting stories, right? You've got Marcus Cannon. Um, you've got David Andrews, Joe Thune, Trent Brown from San Francisco. Who actually, I kind of liked a lot. Um, how do you feel? about this offensive line in general what are their strengths and weaknesses i think right now the biggest strength that they have is that they're all healthy uh last week uh we saw the first time all year where everybody was truly healthy and and we, it was talked about all week in practice how the li- the linemen actually you know kind of stood around and and looked at each other like hey everybody's here like this is this is this is great um marcus cannon's fought injuries the last couple of years he, he was an all pro in 2016 and then he earned his contract in november um uh, obviously, they, they drafted Isaiah Wynn to come in and compete at right tackle, in my opinion, and, and compete at one of the tackle spots. A lot of people thought they would kick him in the guard. I, I think he's if, if Dante Scarnecchia thinks he's a tackle, he's a tackle. Um, but Trent Brown, yeah, Trent Brown's been it, – it's been a little roller coastery. Obviously, when you're talking about a guy of that size, um, I'm really interested to see how he holds up the rest of the year as far as, you know, playing extra games in January. It's a lot mm-hmm. of – a lot of mileage on a big dude like that. He's what six eight three. You know, there's. Yeah. I mean, I've heard, yeah. he's like he's Phil Lode Holty. Yeah, right. Like he's crazy big. Um, but uh, but the interior trio is where it's at uh, with Joe Tooney uh, at left guard, who uh, I wrote a piece last week uh, about his upcoming extension that we could see next next spring. Uh, he's like a total candidate for an early signing. Uh, and then David Andrews, former undrafted guy out of uh, Georgia. And then obviously Shaq Mason, who got an extension in August. Uh, he's he's back. He's healthy. And with all three of those guys, I think they've only missed. 
I believe three or four games uh, since the start of 2016. Um, so they have a ton of chemistry. Um, and once, when they really get going, uh, the Patriots offense, uh, you know, can, can get up to that juggernaut level. All right. Well, um, so, I mean, it sounds like that's going to be a pretty interesting matchup, at least to watch with, uh, with the Vikings defensive line. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I think that's the best. I think that's the most exciting part of, of this, this matchup this weekend watching. <laughs> you really are a nerd, huh? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, it's bad. It's bad. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm I'm pumped to watch uh, how how the Patriots handle you know the edge guys, you know, you mm-hmm. know Griffin and, and Hunter. Obviously, those guys are ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I'm I, I'm gonna watch the the big dudes up in the middle on first and second down. That's that's my thing. All right, so I have Josh Gordon. Uh, Sony Michelle and Rob Gronkowski all on the same fantasy team in the Norse Code League, uh, <laughs> and so and I, I because of you know the way the rosters are constructed and because of the other players I have at, at different positions, uh, I can only start two of them. Uh, which two should I start? And then we can kind of move the conversation to the individual position groups from there. Are, are we? We're assuming that Xavier Rhodes isn't playing. Uh, I, I think he might actually be playing. Is he going to be playing? He was because I, I believe he was like a non-participant yesterday, or I, I couldn't. I, I can't remember. I, I've it's seen tough. so many damn uh, reports. Let's assume yeah. he's playing. Um, I think you start. I think you start Josh Gordon and, and Rob Gronkowski. Um, because I think it's going to be a big James White game. Uh, I think right. if J, if James White can get incorporated in the offense. Uh, uh, the, uh, everybody likes to look at the correlation, like I was talking about with with Sony Michelle's carries and wins. Uh, but when James White gets gets fed out of, out of the backfield and they use him as an extension of the of the run game, um, this offense is completely unstoppable. I mean, we saw it with the opening drive against uh, against Green Bay. He, uh, you know, I believe he had like sixty yards receiving on just the opening right. drive or something like that. But um, I think uh, th- I think I really truly think they're going to be. Th- I think they throw it forty five times this week uh, this week and maybe 50 times uh there's just just no reason to to even mess with that front seven of minnesota's uh like i said spread it spread them out get gronk isolated and i i think what it's gonna be jay uh uh jay von is it jay von or jay ron curse jay ron curse yeah we'll probably jay see ron curse on on gronkowski most yeah yeah because i know uh i was listening to um I think Andy Carlson was talking about uh, how how Harrison Smith hasn't been stellar in man coverage this year. So, right. um, yeah, go with go with Gronk, and then yeah, go with go with Gordon because he'll he's uh, he's had at least five targets, I believe, in each of the last six or seven games. All right. Well, well, uh, well, that leads me to ask, I think, a little bit more about the running backs. We've seen a lot of receiving backs, especially in New England, uh, as they kind of rotate through. Uh, you know, over the years, but a lot of our perception of New England running backs is that they were fairly fungible. Lose one, grab another one. Lose one, grab another one. Uh, famously cut Jonas Gray after a 200 yard game because he was late to a meeting in a snowstorm. Didn't miss a beat, <laughs> right? right? So yep. uh, James White, it, it feels like, um, and obviously they drafted Sony Michelle uh, in the first round, so they obviously have a commitment to him. But James White, it feels like they have a commitment to him too. If I'm uh, remembering this correctly, they did extend him, which I think is kind of unusual for a Patriots running back. What makes him so special? among a league where we see receiving backs kind of all the, even among feature backs like Gurley. Um, but you know, they were willing to let go of, you know, people like Danny Woodhead or whatever, right? What makes him so special? What makes him a, a better class or a more valuable class rather of receiving back? Well, when you, I think what you're talking about, um, as far as it is released to his extension and his, and his, you know, staying with the team, the team making an investment long-term the fact is he's pretty cheap. Uh, he, okay, he, that helps. He, yeah. I mean, he came pretty cheap. He was, uh, like, um, like I was talking with Joe Tooney earlier. He was one of the uh, few Patriots that are on the roster right now who signed, uh, in that, that, that winter after their third season, uh, where you're first initially allowed to start mm-hmm. negotiating, you know, as you go into your fourth year, um, this they signed him like his Super Bowl heroics, right? Yeah, correct. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, they, yeah, they signed him, uh, just after, yeah, after his third season and, uh, he's extremely economical, obviously. And he's another guy, obviously he's not on, on the level of a, a Diggs or a Brady or anything like that, but he's a guy who started from just bare bones, no, you know, obviously knowing nothing about the offense and barely getting any snaps to, to the point where he he's made that every year progression. Uh, we saw 60 catches last year, uh, you know, obviously after, you know, the heroics in the Super Bowl, um, but 60 catches last year. And I think he's, he's on pace. He was on pace at one point for 110 catches this year. Uh, it's, it's obviously dipped now in the last couple of weeks, but uh, um, 
he's oh, he's an excellent blitz pick. Uh, you know, he's great in blitz pickup, uh, even for such a small guy. Uh, he's he's handled the ball on the ground pretty well this year. Um, he's obviously not going to break a ton of tackles or anything, but uh, and I mean they use him in every single wide receiver spot too. Obviously, we'll see a ton of that this weekend, and as I anticipate, they they, they spread everything out. Even with James Devlin, you'll see Devlin out there <laughs> right. at, the, at the X wide receiver spot. So, um, but but he he's a really adept route runner, and uh, and he can make you pay in a, in a bunch of different spots on the field. And and the more you can do for a Bill Belichick team the more uh the more value you have to the organization so uh, and that and he's got some lovely cap hits right yeah well it's also got to be <laughs> kind of a, a, a cheat code for the offense because you, you split them out out wide you immediately know you know whether or not they're man in zone right so oh, that, yeah. that's gonna help you'll too. see him you'll see him a ton i mean it probably probably a dozen times on sunday he'll it, even if that is not their intent to just keep spreading them out and you know just to just for the passing game's sake, but you'll see him come back into the start out wide and come back into the backfield at least at least a half a dozen times, probably up, upwards of a dozen times, because um, just that little bit of motion is all Tom needs to kind of diagnose what they need or what they want to do. But um, obviously, you'll see some other complex motions and, and and things like that. But you'll see that's probably the most common thing they do to mm-hmm. identify everything. Um, well, I mean, uh, Bill Belichick is no stranger to kind of unusual defensive strategies, both in response to what teams have done to Gronk, and also he himself is also, uh, you know, like put cornerbacks on tight ends and so on. Would it be appropriate? I'm just kind of spitballing based off of what you're saying. Would it be appropriate to just assign James White uh, a nickel corner, so long as that nickel corner had, you know, pretty good tackling ability? Because it sounds like the way he runs routes, he's not really a match for a lot of linebackers. Yeah, uh, I think when when you when we see that happen, he he is eliminated from the passing game. Uh, so especially when he's split out wide, uh, he, he's not going to beat corners, uh, you know, like a wide receiver would. And that's and that's why. Uh, I was raising so much hell in the, in the, in the summer when we were talking about the, the Patriots consistently filtering through these wide receivers, you know, bringing guys in and cutting them and, you know, Kenny Britt yeah. and Jordan Matthews and, and all these guys, uh, because, you know, everybody was talking, you know, about how well, we're going to be fine. They've got James white. They can move him into the slot. Rex Burkhead can go into the slot. And, and it's just not how it goes. You, you, you know, wide receivers beat corners. Running backs do not, unless they're named Alvin Kamara, uh, you know, they don't consistently beat corners on routes. I mean, that's it's what all corners do is defend routes all day. That's, <laughs> that's, you know, that's their job, you know, and, uh, and, and we see it with James white when, when, but, but it does force a team. If it forces a team to, to come in a corner, then obviously you've got, you've got a mismatch somewhere else. Get so. it. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Well, so that, that, that's pretty interesting. Um, I do want to ask about Sony Michelle, though, because, uh, you know, we always think about the Patriots as a forward thinking organization. And then they do something that the analytics community is like, ah, what a waste of like a first round pick. <laughs> right. Um, and it, it doesn't help that, you know, he's been injured, too. So uh, how do you evaluate it? Do you think it was a wasted pick? I mean, whether or not he's talented, that's kind of a different question. Um, but then also let's ask some questions about, you know, how talented or how helpful to the offense he is. Well, he, obviously, I, I love. Uh, he was personally, he was my like RB three coming in, into the uh, coming oh, out. Oh, I, yeah, I loved him too. Yeah, uh, uh, I had him just above Chubb, um, at, uh, who was my RB four. I was actually surprised to see that they took Sony Michelle over Nick Chubb because I thought with with Deion Lewis leaving to free agency, <laughs> um, obviously there's been a ton of storylines around that lately. Right. Um, right. Uh, with, with, with I, I really thought they would bring in um, some size with with Nick Chubb. Obviously, he's got the athletic the athleticism profile that checks all their boxes too. Right. He's a crazy athlete, but um, but you know when they took Sony, it, it, you know made sense. He's a better. I guess he's more adept in the pass blocking. I didn't see a ton of that from Chubb anyway. But uh, uh, you know, and with with already having that uh, that other first round pick and taking Isaiah Wynn, I felt maybe they thought it was a, a little bit of a luxury, but. Um, you know, their guy was there and they went out and got him and they were excited about him. Uh, and we're starting to see him kind of get, get, uh, take on a couple more responsibilities as far as in the, in the passing game. I think he took his first or maybe a second or third uh, carry out of shotgun uh, to start last week's win. Um, a lot of it has been out of like 21 and pers- 21 personnel and 12 personnel. Um, and, it, you know, he missed the whole preseason. So they were basically telegraphing when he was in the game that, that you know, all of September when they were losing in Jacksonville and Detroit, uh, when he was in the game, they were in 12 personnel and they ran it about um, like a 95% clip. 
uh, they were telegraphing what they were going to do. So it was pretty vanilla. Um, but uh, we've seen it now where uh, obviously they've, they've got a little more balance with him in, in the game and they even incorporate him in the passing game a little bit. So moving forward, obviously I think they, they think the sky's the limit for the guy uh, and th- just having that extra, that fifth year option available to them at the end of his uh, rookie contract is I think something that they saw uh, as a, as a big upside too. All right. Well, let's talk about this receiving core because it's definitely, I think, the most fascinating receiving core in the NFL. Because um, you've got a former quarterback in Julian Edelman, you've got a former fullback in Chris Hogan, you've got a pure special teamer in Matthew Slater, um, Josh Gordon. I mean, you could write novels about him, uh, and then a a pure kick returner, not even a punt returner, a pure kick returner <laughs> in Cordero Patterson, uh, who has made a name uh, as a bit of a, a kind of a running back insert, a yards after catch guy. Obviously, uh, with uh, with a game against Minnesota coming up, there's there's kind of that storyline as well. Um, tell me what you find kind of most intriguing about this. I mean, I didn't even talk about Philip Dorsett in the first round, uh, I guess, uh, bust. Um, but tell me what you find most interesting about this this receiving core. And then we can talk about a lot of the players individually. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a cast of characters, isn't it? Like, it's it's pretty wild. Um, the, the Patriots, can can you play ball? All right, cool. You, you can play for the Patriots. Like, just, just play football. Um with Cord- Cordell Patterson, th- that whole the acquisition of him uh, really didn't make any sense from because I'm I'm still into the cap and everything and his cap hit didn't make sense to me. But now that I see all the value they're getting from him, from you know he's playing, he might as well he might as well be taking defensive snaps at this point. The guy's been like just in like every <laughs> role you get like last weekend they were lining him up as like an up back tight end. Um, in like bigger, uh, bigger 21 personnel, all right? Yeah, sure. right. Like all kind, like, yeah, sure. Why, you know what? Why not? Oh, okay. And then Stoney had a knee tweak. So let's give him a goal line carry and have him try to hurdle from the three yard line. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's wild. Um, but you know, they're, they're, they're making it work. Uh, as far as I think, you know, Jules, Julian Edelman, uh, is obviously the number one target and, and he's, he's shown that is he's still got all the juice, uh, coming off that ACL, uh, from last year. He's still got all the juice in, in his, uh, in his short area quickness. And, uh, he's obviously going to be huge down the stretch, but uh, Josh Gordon is, 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 is working his way into the offense as well. Last week it was five catches on five targets and, and none of them seemed unnatural or forced. They were all kind of just part of the offense, um, which was a big thing, uh, and, and really cool to right. see because a lot of it was kind of forced. Yeah. Um, and then there's Chris Hogan, who I, I just, he's, uh, I've, I don't think anybody's been more outspoken about Chris Hogan than, than myself. Um, I ran like, I ran a Twitter poll back in March when Des Bryant got caught. Uh, and it was, you know, who, who would be a better wide receiver two for the Patriots in 2018, Des Bryant or Chris Hogan. And I, I kid you not 50% nice. of the I results were Chris Hogan. And it was, just, I love it. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, he's like the, the ultimate product of a system. So like, you know, we, he, he's not going to, you know, we saw it in September. He's not going to beat guys like Darius Slay or he's not going to beat Xavier Rhodes. You know, you know, or anybody like that. Uh, but when he's, when he's in the role he's meant for, which is wide receiver three, you know, coming in, you know, uh, you know, maybe you're finding a soft spot behind a linebacker and play action, you know, four catches for 38 yards, you know, is mm-hmm. about the most you'll see from him. That's, that's cool. So, I mean, they got all, yeah. And then personally, I'd love to see more Philip Dorsett because we've saw, we've actually seen some good progression from him as far as route running and everything this year. But, um, it's yeah, it's a cast of characters, man. I tell you, who deserves the flash nickname more, Cordero Patterson or Josh Gordon? <laughs> I don't think we can take it from Josh yet, but I mean, I, you, uh, you, I haven't seen much of the flash. Like uh, some of that, like crazy speed we saw from him earlier in his career mm-hmm. doesn't, doesn't seem to be there anymore. But I mean, that's, I guess that's to be expected. Um, you know, he's getting older obviously and hasn't, didn't have a ton of experience, didn't have a ton of experience for a while. So, <laughs> yeah, <right>. you, know, <laughs> you know, so you, if you lose, you know, a half a step, you know, it's understandable, but you know, you can still see the burst from him, um, mm-hmm. in, in spots, especially on, you know, when he's ice out out there and, and, you know, uh, like a three step, like a quick in, he's got some, he's really starting to get the timing going with Tom. Right. Uh, on like play action and, and, and everything. And uh, they're running plays for him now. And uh, I don't know. We, we, he's, he's on pace. His numbers are on pace pretty much to, to, to match Brandon cooks his last year. If you, if you extrapolate them for 16 games, obviously Brandon cooks drew like a million defensive pass interferences that, that brought him into the red zone. But so he's not doing that, but uh, he, he's been exactly what they, what they needed. 
Uh, so what are the? I mean, so there's a bunch of new faces at receiver. We just brought that up, and then also players who uh, fairly or unfairly kind of have a reputation for not necessarily being the mo- most nuanced players. People like Patterson and Dorsett and so on. I mean, I've heard really good things about their ability to pick up the Patriots' offense. So it's not as if that's actually the case. But I mean, that was kind of the reputation. The Patriots also have a famously complex offense, maybe too famous. Maybe it's overhyped how complex it is. But what are the challenges bringing all of these new players? I mean, Josh Gordon comes in. Uh, you know, way too late into the off season. Patterson, obviously, uh, Dorsett, I just mentioned. What are the challenges getting all of that up to speed? And do you think that might also kind of play a role in the discussions we're having about Brady's efficacy? I, absolutely. Um, I think uh, Josh McDaniels talked about it. I think it was a couple of weeks ago um, about how when you bring a guy in like uh, like they're doing now with Josh, how how it's really about breaking it down into little bunches and little stages. And you know, you start with just a little section of the playbook, and then you kind of build onto that. And it's kind of like Legos, where where you kind of you, you're adding to it, and their system is kind of you know it reaches out with branches of different you know a different they're, concept. They're literally teaching them a language and and going through the same process that right to teach so, okay interesting yeah and i can't like i can't imagine like the amount of actual like information that has to be pouring into these guys brains on a daily basis because i mean it's it's you know they are it's grueling it's uh you know all, I, mean, I mean as grueling as learning a playbook can be but it's right you know it's difficult stuff and uh and you see it i, I think the the best uh the best evidence we have that, that a guy is picking it up um, and, and is when he's getting more access to different personnel groupings on game day, obviously their, their installs are a little different per, you know, per week. But like, for instance, this past week, we saw uh, Cordero Patterson and Josh Gordon in on 21 personnel when it was clearly a running situation where normally it would be, uh, obviously they wanted size in there. Uh, mm-hmm. And they and normally Julian Edelman's in there as as one of your wide receivers. He's he's a great blocker. He's obviously he wants to go scrap. That's his deal. But uh, but to see Josh Gordon in there where we weren't seeing him there earlier in the year where he would be replaced with Chris Hogan or somebody, um, I thought was unique, especially when when they have Cordero Patterson lined up as an up back tight end and, and, and Gordon on the outside and Gordon's crashing down and actually asked to do something in the, in the run game. Uh, it's the first time I've seen that package this year. So it clearly shows that, that he's they're, they're incorporating him new, new things each week, which, uh, which I think is pretty cool. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, the, these tight ends. Cause I think, uh, I mean, there's some fairly good statistical evidence that, you know, as Gronkowski goes, so does the the passing offense. Um, but you also have like Dwayne Allen, who who, who uh, w- was pretty interesting for a while with the Colts. Then you've got one of the Wyoming twins and Jacob Hollister. I don't. Did you ever grab the other Wyoming twin at one point? We, yeah, he uh, he actually signed as an undrafted free agent. And he's oh, yeah, still, he's on yeah. uh, non football. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So he's still uh, they. Yeah, he was on NFI this year. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he had a, something going on in the offseason. There's no no reports of what the hell happened to him so, you know that's the basic sure. yeah but um uh, yeah, i mean yeah, yeah I mean, let, let's let's hear about those two first and then we'll talk about gronk well yeah I, Dwayne allen he's brought in and, and he was a he was a, a real uh sticking point for patriots fans uh, his, his cap hit is glaring when you look at his production in the passing game and uh you know i believe it's it's a they restructured they you know it was clear they were going to have to restructure his deal and they did um but it wasn't drastic it didn't save multi millions of dollars i believe it only saved around a million and a million and a third maybe but um it's not like a Brady restructure. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it was crazy this year with the cap. I mean, the, the Patriots, they, I mean, they don't do this, this conversion, the salary, you know, signing bonus to salary conversion all the time. Uh, they only have done it three times up until this year or twice up until this year. And they've done, already done it twice this year, which is pretty wild. But anyway, uh, Allen is in there to block. He's another tackle. Yeah. That's, 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 the, that's the goal when he's on the field They're they're, they're really, they want to, they want to pound you. Um, and as good as Gronk has been when he's been in the game, uh, his addition to the run game and what they allow, what they allowed, what they can do in 12 personnel with Allen and Gronk on the field in the run game um, is pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's profound, uh, especially with, with the way Sony Michelle's progressed. And uh, when you can get, you know, Edelman and Gordon out on the outside. And if you, if you're in nickel and they're in 12 personnel, you're going to get run on and it's, it's, it's going to be a problem. They can trap you on the, we've seen them trap, you know, trap teams on the field and nickel or dime and that 12 personnel look and, and it become a problem. But uh, as far as Jake Hollister, I wouldn't expect him to see the field. I, sure. I, I don't really think he's uh 
he's he's really a replacement level player um, who's kind of been battling injuries this year and uh, kind of been up and down with that uh, active inactive and stuff. But uh, nothing nothing to worry about there. But Dwayne Allen, he was inactive last week. He might be. I see he was limited in participation this week, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was uh, a, a scratch this weekend. So it might be uh, just a ton of like a, a ton of three receiver, four receiver looks this weekend. All right. Um, well, then we should talk about Gronkowski because I think he is kind of the star uh, of the offense. I mean, uh, I mean, he's done so much, I think, when he's been on the field and healthy, uh, which is becoming an increasing rarity. But there is definitely a moment in time where he was the best receiving tight end in the NFL and one of the top five blocking tight ends uh, in the NFL, which is kind of like you take Vernon Davis and you supercharge it. Uh, and so yeah. um, it, it's kind of like there are people with, who are more athletic than Gronkowski. There are people with just as much size or more size than Gronkowski. Um and Gronkowski never strikes anybody as being particularly the most intelligent, uh, you know, player on the football field. So what is it that makes him the best? Maybe in the history of the NFL. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, we see it every we see it every week now. Every it doesn't matter what games on TV. There's there's multiple guys the same size as, as Gronk. Um, like, I mean, you watch Tennessee and John U. Smith. That guy's a beast. Right. Uh, and he's and he's you know he's got to be he's got to be like a half second faster than Gronk. It feels like you know. Um, but uh, with with Gronk, it's really um, the the guy is so he's so good at at. at handling his size and he's so good at playing with leverage. Uh, obviously he gets, he gets beat up a lot on the routes and, and Patriots fans are constantly complaining about right. the lack of pass interference calls on him and this and that, but you know, it's, what are you going to do? I mean, what are you going to, you know, if you're going to start calling ticky tack fouls with, you know, Rob Gronkowski in the route stem, then just, you can't play, you can't guard him. Um, but that, I mean, and he's still, he, he can still jump and, uh, and he's still really, really good at, uh, at using his body to shield and, 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 and can, you know, you know, to high point the football and shielding, uh, defenders from the football. Uh, and you know, he still runs pretty crisp routes and, and it helps when you have, uh, chemistry with a guy like Tom Brady, you know, who can put, put it on you and, uh, and generally doesn't get you into too much trouble with, uh, with bad passes and, and whatnot. He's not, he, Gronk's really not asked to do too much as far as making crazy catches, um, that put his body in harm these days. Uh, you know, he, he can, he can still get it done. All right. Um, well, let's uh, shift focus to the defense. We talked a lot about the Patriots offense, but Bill Belichick is a defensive mind. I think people forget this. So uh, let's uh, let's talk about kind of what's happening. With that defense they are kind of always at the forefront of defensive innovation. Um, but it feels like you've got some problems up front. Um, I've got Trey Flowers in my IDP league, so I'm very happy with him. I know he can produce, um, but you know it feels like he's maybe the most underrated player on the team uh, when you talk about kind of like who people are talking about the Patriots nationally. Um, but the rest of that defensive line, it feels like maybe they're not producing. And maybe I could be wrong. Maybe you could set the record straight with me. But kind of walk me through kind of what's happening along that defensive line. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you, br- you brought it up but when the conversation kind of it always starts with Trey Flowers. Um, the guy plays, he can play every spot on the line. Obviously it's down dependent, but, uh, he's, a, he's a beast. He's a, he's a monster. He's, he's so good, um, at state his pad level. You know, it's like, it's like a, it's like a Dane Brugler read, you know, checklist, just read off, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just pad level and, you know, uh, but I mean, the, the, he doesn't create a ton of, he, he's not going to throw a cr- bunch of crazy, you know, swim moves. And he's, he's not super active on the edge with his hands and everything, but, uh, really he, he does his best work as an interior sub rusher on third downs. Um, when they ask him to do that and we'll see a lot of Dante Hightower coming out or Kyle Van Noy out around on the strong side. Um, but, uh, you know, he, this could be, this is likely going to be, in my opinion, his last year with new England. He, he's said to be a free agent next year and the franchise tag is going to be up North of 17 million again. Um, and I think he'll get Vernon, you know, Olivier Vernon type money on the open right. market with the cap going up to around, you know, 19, you know, or 190 million. I think he's going to, he's, he's definitely, when you, when guys hit the open market, they're going to get better money than Daniel Hunter, um, the, the sign for, uh, just because the market's going to be so crazy. But, um, moving on inside, uh, Lawrence guy, former Viking, former, <laughs> former, former half the league, uh, 
you know, they signed him before last, right. you know, last off season. He's been, he's been really solid. I don't understand where his PFF grades are coming from. Um, everybody loves, loves Lawrence guy. And he's, but he, he doesn't make the, he, it's not as if he's making a ton of plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage. He's, he's sound, um, with two gapping and, you know, they put him on the, you know, they put him at like five tech on early downs sometimes too. Uh, but I don't get where all this, uh, this PFF hype comes from, but you know, those grades can get a little interesting sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, but you know, and then moving inside, you got Malcolm Brown, who, uh, that's another guy I've been really critical of. He's, he's just not good. And you know, he's uh, a big reason uh, in my opinion that they, you know, they lost the Super Bowl last year. The, the, the lack of integrity they had inside, um, and we saw it all in the beginning of this year, too. Um, the guy just gets moved, and it's 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 unfortunate. But um, he has flashes here and there. But, uh, yeah, and then, see, and then you got, you know, they, they'll rotate Adrian Claiborne and, and Dietrich right. Wise in on the other edge, too. Um, but You've got, uh, like, kind of a who's who of, like, draft darlings, right? Because you've got Derek Rivers. Oh, a lot yeah. of people expected a lot from him. Uh, Danny Shelton uh, is yep. supposed to be very good at the very specific job that he tends to have. You mentioned Dietrich Wise. People loved him. I think Arkansas. Uh, John Simon, I think, from Ohio State. Yep. Um, a, a bunch of guys that people – I mean, people loved Adrian Claiborne coming out of the draft. Um uh, way, what's the? I mean, why am I not hearing these names more often? I mean, even when I bring them up to you, you're like, "Oh yeah, that guy." Like, what's yep. the deal? Yep, yep, we, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's just, yep, we have them. Yep, yeah, they're on the roster. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah. You know, Derek Rivers has struggled to make the active roster every week. Um, I mean, he's only been active a handful of times, even though he's completely healthy. He looked good in the preseason. He looked good, and when I say looked good, he was beating some poor soul, uh, right. Washington right tackle, and you know. But um, I thought we'd see more, but I, clearly, you know, there, there's so much depth there. Um, and, you know, when, when it comes to guys with their hand on the ground, if, if you can't play, because he's he definitely he's always he was always going to be one of those guys, you know, uh, can, is he going to be playing with his hand on the ground? Is he going to be covering, you know, forced to cover in space? And if you can't cover in space, you know, you can't be active on game day. But uh, he's obviously good enough to, to still be on the 53. Obviously, they have an investment in him. But um yeah, it's uh, that's a little frustrating. But again, it, w the hope is that it's because he's behind. Uh, he's just down on the depth chart. Um, you've got guys with experience like John Simon, who has been getting some play recently for help force him and Trey Flowers help force an interception last week with some pressure. And um, Adrian Claiborne has been kind of uh, I think the best thing we saw from him this year was the next gen stats had him at like almost 19 miles an hour on an interception return for a touchdown by Devin McCourty like, <laughs> at like 280 uh, okay. pounds. Like what? Like and that is impressive, but also uh, maybe having that at the top of your uh, <laughs> what achievement list on your Xbox right. profile is, is maybe not amazing. Right. Well, it's no wonder you're losing contain Adrian, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but no, it's, uh, it, I, I really, I think this, this depth that we're seeing from them, it, they can, they, they bring waves of depth at you and, and that's going to be huge. It's, it really is remarkable how healthy they are moving in as we get deeper into this year. Cause you know, when you get into the playoffs, obviously it's great to have guys like Everson Griffin and Daniil Hunter, but you know, if, if you don't, and you don't have depth, then you, you just, you lose an, you lose all the integrity on the edge. And, uh, we've seen it happen to the Patriots where you're playing, you know, James Harrison in the super bowl, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. This stuff happens. So yeah, fix it. <laughs> all right. Well, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I've been there too, man. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, <laughs> um, the, the linebacking court, because I think, um, so, I mean, everyone is kind of familiar. Dr. Hightower is like really spectacular at some of the specific stuff that he does, especially as like a blitzing linebacker and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they've made some decisions. I think Jamie Collins is kind of the one that a lot of people kind of remember. And and a lot of people are like, well, a Landon Roberts or whoever uh, would be the guy to kind of replace Jamie Collins. And he doesn't play like the same kind of game. Uh, and then Kyle Van Noy from Detroit, a huge surprise. I think he's playing really well. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I mean, he played awfully uh, in, in Detroit, um, but he seems to be playing pretty well here. He keeps kicking my ass in Madden um, <laughs> kind of out of nowhere. Maybe that's kind of why I think he, he's playing well. Maybe he's not actually, <laughs> but um, 
Sometimes I feel like that's where the PFF grades come from. Like if (laughs) if the grader is getting, you know, consistently beat in Madden with from, you know, by a player, it must mean something and it's skewing the evaluation point. I think it fixes on me. I mean, I just, what is that? Um, (laughs) I'm also like not a very good Madden player. Hey, 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 me too, man. I, I, uh, I play pro. I like to just play pro against the computer and just enjoy myself a little bit. Cause once the second I, I ratchet up to all pro against, the computer it's a disaster right yeah and i don't have fun and i can't play against other people because i'm just not good so like it's not fun <laughs> you know it's, and i'm like why is antonio brown dropping the ball all the time right. oh it's because i am mistiming the throw whatever i mean <laughs> I, I i can never be critical of nfl quarterbacks who like feel phantom pressure because i feel it in madden you know like <laughs> Like it's bad, you know. Like I'm, I, I check down in Madden. That's my favorite play. Is a check down to James White <laughs> with Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, but yeah, let's let's talk about this uh, uh, linebacker board because I think uh, after you get past those three names, it's like a bunch of people who like whose names don't I think strike a chord. Um, our lads has has Duran Harmon listed as a linebacker too. Uh, maybe he's playing that role, but I remember as my as the obligatory Rutgers pick, uh, he's a yes. safety. But, um, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I mean, the, t- tell me about these linebackers. Uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Why are they doing what they do? Is uh, Kyle Van Noy actually good, or am I just traumatized? <laughs> actually, hashtag actually good. Um, <laughs> right. You know, like as long as Kyle Van Noy is not defending a wheel route, he has been hashtag actually good. Okay. Uh, okay. Like my nightmares are like Damian Williams burning him last year on a wheel route, like stuff like that. Like he, he's he's if you can if you can find a way to force Kyle Van Noy to guard anybody in the space for a prolonged amount of time, you're going to that's a matchup you want. Uh, but really, they, they kind of they they do a good job of rotating him and Dante uh, Hightower. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll have one of them playing the mic and and but they, they really do a good job of disguising who it's going to be and who's coming. And and, and Alan and Roberts on early downs will be the thumper, uh, you know, just just strictly for. Uh, you know, early down run, you know, run stuffing. But again, if you get him in the space, we've seen what happens, uh, you know, you know, in the Super Bowl against, you know, against Atlanta, um, we, we saw his deficiencies in coverage. He hasn't improved since then in coverage. So that's uh, that's something you'll, you'll want to try to exploit. But um, they're also they're, obviously they're really sound in their their run fits that, you know, that's that's the one thing that I think is going to be big this weekend um, is, you know, is, def- is making sure Dalvin cook uh, can't, can't get going. Um, obviously you guys have got some issues going uh, on the, on the offensive line, on the interior. Uh, I think, um, I think a couple of well-timed, uh, a, you know, a, a gap blitzes, which we see from Van Noy and Hightower all the time uh, can, can definitely turn the ball game, especially if it's going to be a tight game. Uh, we've seen a lot more blitzing this year from uh, Brian Flores, the new defensive coordinator. He's kind of technically the defensive coordinator, but he's the play caller this year. Right. Um, and they really missed Jawan Bentley, uh, who they drafted out of Purdue right. in the fifth round, who I, I just, I, I, when I watched him, I just didn't understand why they would take him. He looked stiff and boring and slow, uh, but he looked nothing like that when he came to Patriots camp. Uh, unfortunately, he's on IR. He's not going to be a, uh, participating the rest of the year. So yeah, they, they definitely, they definitely miss him because he looks like a, a guy who could be that next Jamie Collins, Collins ish type of guy. Wow. Okay. Yeah. He did not look Maybe, like that in the scene. Like, like, yeah, not like, not that crazy athleticism, but that same type of role where they, they feel comfortable to like put him on, you know, to overhang him or, right. you know, uh, you know, take on guys, you know, like take on tight ends one-on-one. He, he, he looked really good. It was like, yeah, definitely shocking. All right. Well, let's um, let's talk about these defensive backs. You've got, of course, another set of twins, the McCordy twins. You've also got um, I mean, it's 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 fun, right? Because you've got Patrick Chung, who I feel like has been there forever. Um, yeah. And then you've got Stefan Gilmore, who uh, is really phenomenal and, and has some weeks where, you know, he looks like the Stefan Gilmore of old and some weeks where you're like, uh, you know, maybe bring Malcolm Butler back. Um, you've got Jonathan <laughs> Jones. You've got Deron Harmon. Um, what's, what's the, uh, I mean, uh, Obi Melifonwu, another yeah. draft darling. Um, uh, what's, what's the deal? Uh, how do you feel about these defensive backs? Are they the reason that like the Patriots always rank the, at the top in yards allowed, but also, um, have like this crazy good, uh, points allowed. I mean, it's every year. It's like, they've got the biggest disparity. Right. Oh yeah. 
I mean, Stefan Gilmore is doing the exact same thing we saw last year where, you know, it starts off at the beginning of the year and it's a complete disaster. And, and, and he looks lost. Uh, and, and as they try to get their, their communication in the secondary, I mean, uh, everybody always likes to bring up the, the Carolina Panthers game at home in week four of last year. I believe it was that they end up losing on a Graham Gano field goal. But the, uh, Kelvin Benjamin had like two plays where he was completely left wide open. You know, it was Gilmore's responsibility. And we, we kind of saw burning you. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like yeah, not not good. Um, and then we we saw it again, you know, uh, miscommunication in Detroit um, on that unfortunate game, uh, you know, with him and McCourty. But uh, ever since then, he, I mean, he's been as locked down as you can get. I think mm-hmm. I saw something this uh, today on Twitter of uh, Pro Football Focus, or I believe it was Pro Football Focus's stats, um, which are actually really good. They're like their stats department's excellent, but. Uh, he's the best. He's like the second, second, like most efficient third and fourth down corner in the league this year. Right. Um, so, you know, obviously that's huge when you get down on the red zone, you force field goals when you're making plays. So, but, um, moving, moving along, uh, to, to the McCourty twins, Jason McCourty has been a godsend when they brought him in. They, you know, really? they traded him. Yeah. He's been excellent. Interesting. Um, he's okay. been really like, wow, like really good. Um, they, uh, they tweaked his contract and, they gave him some, you know, they gave him some incentive money and, uh, it's, it's worked out great. Uh, I, I expect to see him. I would expect to see him on, uh, on Stefan Diggs this weekend. I, I think, really? uh, well, so well, what, what do you think is the difference in the McCordy Gilmore skill set, And how do you think that applies to kind of determining who covers who between Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen? I really, th- I think McCourty looked really fast uh, for, uh, you know, being so old. He's right. old. You know, I can't believe it. <laughs> He's <I'm>, old. Yeah. <laughs> you old, man. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I think, I, I don't think it'll be a true, um, well, you know, a true follow each other. Right, same, yeah. you know, Not like a game. Levis Island, but like, you know, like right. a, a 56, 65% shadow sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not because the, the skill set for McCourty and, and Gilmore are, are, a lot more similar than we saw last year with McCor- uh, with with Gilmore and Butler, where Butler was taking the smaller, faster guys and Gilmore was taking the bigger, you know, handsier guys. But I think I just feel like Gilmore uh, and Thielen is too good of a matchup, and I just have to see it. Maybe maybe that's what, <laughs> that's what like, you want. Okay. <laughs> and I I'm a pers- I personally am a believer. I don't. This is probably going to be like total blast for me, but I think that Stephon Diggs is the best receiver in the division, like of the NFC North, and that includes obviously Adam. You're on Thielen. the right I podcast, think- buddy. I've been. I've yeah. been Stephon Diggs is the best receiver. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. Let's do this. This is where we <laughs> insert insert the Viking. <laughs> 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 All right, James, get on that. <laughs> um, but you know, I think uh, I think Gilmore and and Thielen, Gil- Gilmore's really good at that tight press, and obviously, you know, Thielen's ridiculous. That's, a, that's a particularly interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Thielen's yeah. release is is elite. Okay, cool. Again, I just feel like I, I is am I, am I wrong in thinking that that Thielen makes a lot of contested catches? Like he he's he's constantly. I mean, obviously he makes it, he makes a ton of catches in general, but I feel like he's, he's covered more often than Stefan Diggs is. Is that correct? In that assi- Am I correct there? Uh, it, it's, 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 it's difficult. Um, Cause one of the problems is that last year it was case Keenum throwing the ball. Uh, and so yeah. uh, you'd end up leading receivers into coverage. And so they'd end up making a bunch of contested catches. So Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen uh, were number one and number six in contested catch rate. And then also combined for the most contested catches period, because you know, it's rate times opportunity mm-hmm. uh, in, in last year in the NFL. And so both of them ended up making a lot of contested catches, but a lot of that was ball placement. Uh, this year, they're both doing really well in contested catch rate, but the amount has gone down. And I think a lot of that has to do with ball placement, but I think you're right. They do end up making, especially Thielen this year, given how they've used him versus Diggs, which the pattern has changed. Uh, yeah, I think you're right that Thielen still ends up making a lot of contested catches. I don't know if that's necessarily the result of him being unable to separate and more the result of, well, Thielen's half a step open, which means he's very open. It's kind of like a trust right. develop. It's, right. you know, it's, it's one creates the other, right? Like is Mike Evans bad exactly. at separating or you always throw to Mike Evans? Right. Exactly. Um, so, and, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both, but I mean, we both well, agree maybe, that Diggs is the better receiver. So maybe I'm just, I'm super like, like on, on my recency bias BS right now. And just, I can't get that Jair Alexander 
can right? test yeah, yeah. out of my head. Like, yeah, oh my the, god, the almost that Josh Jones interception. Yeah, yeah, like, oh my Oof. lord. Um, but yeah, so so I'm gonna yeah I, I'm gonna say it's Gilmore on Thielen, but um, who who knows? I think it's pick your poison. I think I think those guys are gonna get theirs. You know, that's just how it goes. Those two are gonna get theirs, and as long as as he can handle Rudolph with McCourty, um, who we've seen have had some coverage issues earlier in the year, um. Handle Rudolph in the red zone with McCourty or, or and or Chung, um, and then we'll see uh, we'll see John Jones and maybe a little of uh, of Duke Dawson, second rounder out of Florida. Dawson, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he um he was on IR and he designated to return. He was the first guy they designated, and he's active now. And he's been primarily in the slot. So uh, him and John Jones, I think we'll see in there. And uh, I, I I sure hope we don't see much of J.C. Jackson. Uh, the underrated guy out of um, Maryland. Uh, he's been kind of up and down. He's been okay, but uh, I just I feel like you know when he, if he's in the game, that means that somebody else is having right. A, yeah, you know, a, poor the game, plan so. has gone awry. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. So, uh, right. but yeah, I, I'm kind of hoping to see a little uh, little Duke Dawson on on Sunday. We'll we'll, yeah. we'll see. Luke Inman and I. So Luke is my co-host on the uh, Andy Luke Reed football, or I guess it's his own coverage football machine now. He's the he's the draft guy, and, and we both yeah. talked about Duke Dawson. We like him a lot as a nickel guy, so that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, okay. So we've gone over everybody. It's always an exhaustive podcast. So hopefully, uh, you know, everybody's got their questions answered. I guess we could ask questions about Koskowski or whatever, but we'll ignore that. Uh, that just that <laughs> just ends up bringing up more questions about our kicker. And frankly, we're done talking <laughs> yeah, about okay, him. Yeah, we definitely don't want that. Um, so give us a, a score. I think Tom Brady over his entire career has lost like 19 regular season games at home. Is it going to be number 20? It sounds like you're not. I mean, I mean, a lot of times the the way this podcast is constructed, people end up trashing their team a lot. But I mean, the Patriots are good. Tom Brady is good. Yeah. Uh, is he going to uh, rack up number 20? What's the what's the score? Yeah. If, if I come off as, as sounding like somebody who is kind of a little down it's on all, the Patriots, it's all- it's yeah. First of all, yes, it's your guys' fault. Uh, second, <laughs> second of all, um, I've actually been pretty vocal. I mean, I've I've made some outlandish statements this year. You know, stuff like you know, I think this could be the best offense we've ever seen in, in New England. Stuff like that, wow. which well, you know, yeah, and and you know, it just has it hasn't materialized. I was going to ask whatever. how that's going for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, honestly think we're just seeing the Patriots scratch the surface, and uh, I think uh, you know a two touchdown victory on the road in New York. A lot of people in New England are downplaying it. I think it was a decisive victory, and it was huge. And I think we are going to see. I think I've got this one circled as the Patriots come out, and it's not it's it's not a two touchdown victory, but it's it's a a really well played it's sort of coming out party for the playoffs. Yes, yeah, it's a well played twenty five to nineteen victory. I like weird scores. Yeah. No, or, maybe, I like this. Maybe, or maybe some scoregami. I don't even yeah. know if there's any scoregami in that that, that range. Uh, I don't think 25 to 19 is a scoregami, but I think there is a scoregami somewhere around in that range, like a like a 23 17. Whatever kind of that weirdness. one is, I yeah. think I, I, I think we'll see, and I think we'll see the under happen. I think both teams are going to really. Right. I think we're going to see some feeling out of, uh, you know, kind of that that first quarter unease. Um, I think you know it's not going to be the, the shootout everybody's thinking. All right. Uh, you steal one player from the Vikings, put him on the Patriots. Who is it? Oh, man. Oh, it's Linval Joseph. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, like he's like the. I don't know. Bill Belichick called Harrison Smith Ed Reed, like, and, and, like oh, yesterday. God, Harrison right? Smith's so good. Oh, <laughs> man. This is brutal. Like, or, or do I go to Neil Hunter or Everson Griffin or Stefan Diggs or Dalvin Cut? Like, gee. Um, <laughs> You got one, man. Yeah. Uh, okay. If I can only have one, then it's it's probably got to be Harrison Smith, just because okay. you know you you get ninety nine percent you know of your defensive snaps played by the guy, and he's the best in the business at what he does. Even though Linball is too, Linball's you know position obviously isn't as critical as mm-hmm. Harrison Smith. I'm going Harrison Smith. How about you guys? Uh, Tom Brady. <laughs> I, I hear he's boring. Well, we have the Vikings have this history of picking up quarterbacks, uh, quote unquote, past their prime or at the oh, very, yeah, yeah, very yeah. Tom edge. Tom Brady eventually no. Viking. Well, it, well, it's really going to be a free agency battle between him and Aaron Rodgers, honestly. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, it's it's in the cards. I, mean, uh, did, I think if, if I was going to exclude Tom Brady and also exclude Cordero Patterson, because uh, that would be funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> that really is the there, best answer. I love it. Right. Uh, probably, I don't know, Gronkowski. Uh, 
I mean, assuming he doesn't like force a retirement by being like forced a, to like play a year and a half of, of Gronk, you think is worth it? Yeah. And tied. <laughs> yeah it's, not, it's not like you need Trey Flowers. Oh, no, it's, it'll just be a Tide Pod accident. It'll be fine. Freak Tide Pod <laughs> accident. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, would you like to uh, take a moment and plug your uh, plug your work? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me, first of all. And uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter at B Phillips underscore SB staff writer for, uh, for the Pat's pulpit. Um, I've been doing uh, I'm going to have a, a, a short like five minute um, video up on the website tomorrow uh, previewing the game, talking about a lot of stuff we just talked about. And then I do a post game show on Facebook Live after the game goes final um, as well on passpulpit.com uh, and a couple of articles uh, each week, including one every Sunday morning. So check me out. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate. Uh, really appreciate the. the I say the, the, the Patriots kind of view of things as uh, uh, as sarcastic, a little down, <laughs> but you're still gonna. You still feel like you're gonna pull it out. You're just a you know, nice, nice gritty victory. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Blue collar <laughs> victory. Exactly. A blue really collar victory. Patriots receiver victory. Well, <laughs> here's the problem with your score An prediction. Adam victory. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Your score prediction actually includes two missed extra points by the Vikings. So that's what oh, that's wow, what got yeah. me. Like 19 is like, how is that? Oh, son of a, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say they were just like miss, you know, um, you know, two point conversion opportunities. But nope. yeah, nope. Uh, miss extra points. <laughs> yeah. it's multiple. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. All right, let's go to the mailbag. And starting off with uh, Corey Ruge, who asks, should the Vikings anticipate Bill Belichick running a high-octane first drive like uh, like the Packers did? Would it be effective even if the defense is ready for it? Uh, technically, though, I think it was the second drive for the Packers. It's just the Vikings had two three outs in between. Um, but no, that's fair. I think that the Vikings have been uh, tremendously poor in opening drives in general. They allowed one, uh, I believe, to Jimmy G. Uh, maybe the Bills one doesn't count. But just generally speaking, uh, I think the Saints is a good example, too. But just generally speaking, it feels like they've done worse on first drives than a lot of other teams, and certainly teams with a level of, of quality along the defense that the Vikings have. So, yes. Um, because it doesn't seem like a trend that's stopping anytime soon. Um, but I think I mentioned this earlier on a different podcast or this podcast that it does seem like they're just kind of boxers kind of feeling out what's happening. So they let a couple of, of punches get in to, to check their reach. But yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see it. It's going to worry Vikings fans and then they're going to clamp up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I hate that feeling too, because we talked about it last game that, uh, the Vikings defense did really well, except for the first like two drives, and you can't help right. just shake that feeling of the uh, of the first drive. Right. Well, it, it seems to I think for at least for fans watching the game, it seems to set the tone. Right. It's like oh, they can get burned at any time. Plus, I'm a Vikings fan. I've seen them get burned at literally every moment of a game. <laughs> um, so uh, oh, we've got this lead. We're we're stopping, but now they've got the ball back, and it's like his name is Aaron Rodgers. His name is Tom Brady. He's going to score. Um, so yeah, it'll set I think a tone for Vikings fans. It's going to be very frustrating because it always does. Um, but yeah, an explosive first drive or, or second drive is going to happen. And I would say that that's probably not the direction the game is going to go in. So, um, yeah, God, uh, especially like the whole, like setting the tone thing, I get more, uh, angry texts from my younger brother in the very first half, because I know <laughs> that's when he's watching because like, it's, especially like it sets the tone. Like I'll get the, the message about Dan barely. <laughs> Uh, and, mm -hmm. and all that, but I can tell when he turned off the game because I stopped getting the the angry texts about how the Vikings are doing. Like it's it's right <laughs> around the first half that I get something, and it's just like, oh yeah, all right. <laughs> he, he's he's either drinking himself into a coma or he's just you know found something else to do. That's that, it's that <laughs> opening. It's that opening tone that gets it. It's like yeah, that for like yeah. every game. Uh, Kenneth Allen asks: Bill Belichick is well known for uh, efficiently. Uh, copying, well, effectively too, uh, copying the best strategies from teams the Patriots admire. Should we worry about them utilizing Philly's strategy to exploit the Ertz-Smith matchup for whomever goes against a finally healthy Gronk? Um, so the biggest issue with uh, Harrison Smith in that game uh, in, in Philadelphia was uh, that he had a number of tendencies or tells. 
uh, that uh, they were able to exploit. It's kind of the same way that you know Todd Gurley was able to get open uh, against Anthony Barr in the red zone is because Barr's assignment was was to was to float over to the middle and, and that created an open opportunity. Um, and so the same thing happened to Harrison Smith, who uh, you know is otherwise pretty excellent safety. Um, but I don't think Harrison Smith is going to be on Gronk all that often. I think it'll be J. Ron Curse. Uh, and so it's a, it's a totally different set of like tells and tendencies and what uh, you know and so on. And then also those tendencies have changed as the defense has changed um, over the past uh, you know several weeks. So uh, even if you find Smith on Gronk a lot, I think it'll be kind of in a different way. Um, and if Belichick finds a way to exploit uh, a new set of tendencies, they will be in new ways. But no, I don't think that'll happen. I think really what ends up happening is um, a bunch of concepts uh, from uh, teams that Belichick admires, so maybe the, the Eagles, end up getting incorporated. And then Belichick makes a bunch of like crazy in-game adjustments that, I mean, we talk a lot about Zimmer's ability to adjust and, and clamp up defensively, but Belichick's ability to adjust is like otherworldly when you get to um, kind of how he changes plays and, and, and his response to plays that haven't even occurred yet. Um, he's playing actually several moves ahead. Um, if we're going to use a chess analogy. So that, I think, is the bigger worry more than it is, hey, there's this game plan that worked against the Vikings. He's just going to use that. Next question is from uh, John Belk, who asks, given Brady's struggles against the Blitz, do you think the Vikings will be dialing up more than usual? In general, at what percent of plays do you hit diminishing returns on Blitzing? Um, well, I mean, it, it's different for every team, right? Um, because uh, the Ravens blitz the second most in the NFL, and they're one of the best defenses in the NFL, if not the best, right, along with the Chicago Bears. The Bears blitz among the least, and they're one of the best defenses in the NFL. The Cardinals are one of the worst defenses in the NFL. They blitz more than the Ravens, the number one in, in blitz rate. So diminishing returns varies by team, coverage, quarterback you're playing, etc. cetera. Uh, and Brady's struggles against the blitz this year, I think, are related to what Brian was talking about in terms of seeing ghosts in the pocket and less about uh, something that is easily kind of exploitable. Um Zimmer tends to blitz a lot less against quarterbacks that have established themselves, whether or not their numbers against the blitz that year are very good, right? Because I think Aaron Rodgers is a really good example. His numbers against the blitz, I think, this year were not phenomenal or anything, but they only blitzed him like three times or six times or something. So the blitzes ended up working out really well, so you can make an argument that – hey, they should have blitzed a little bit more often. Um, but they didn't blitz all that much against the Saints. They didn't blitz all that much against uh, the Packers. I think they won't blitz all that much against the Patriots. And, and maybe an argument should be made that they, whatever the game plan is, maybe they should increase the amount of blitzes. And I would say blitz percentage on dropbacks for the Vikings, they blitz around 24% of the time. Um, and I would say diminishing returns happens around 30 33% probably for for the Vikings. Um, that, I'm just kind of spitballing based off of kind of my assumptions. Um, but uh, and, and that's because there's only so many blitz packages you can have, especially if you're inventing new ones to replace the old ones, uh, which is what Zimmer seems to be doing. And so you end up exhausting them. They end up becoming recognizable. You end up creating those kind of holes and coverages. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think they'll blitz all that much, but I think they'll threaten to blitz a lot. Uh, which is how they create all those great one-on-one -on -one matchups for the defensive linemen. Next question is from Colin Olson, who says, The Pats just played the Jets and Titans with two very different results. While neither benefited from a Pats turnover, the Titans were able to generate three sacks and four additional tackles for loss, whereas the Jets had no sacks and just one tackle for loss. Is the Pats O-line vulnerable or solid? Uh, yeah, so Brian did speak to this question a little bit when he, we were talking about the offensive line. And a lot of it has to do with the returning health of those interior offensive linemen and the communication that they've been able to share amongst each other. So I think that probably plays a really big role. It's a pretty good offensive line. Uh, Brian was worried still, despite that, about the matchup against the Vikings defensive line. Uh, and I would agree with that sentiment. I think that despite the fact that they've got kind of this legendary offensive line coach, and despite the fact that the offensive line has improved, uh, I would say the, the matchup goes in favor of that defensive line and that they'll be able to generate maybe not four sacks or anything like that, um, but a good number of sacks and a good number of tackles for loss. All right. Next question is going to be from uh, Shoby Martin, who asks, how good of a receiver do you think Josh Gordon is? Like top 20, 30, what receiver that we face this year would you uh, compare him with? 
Uh, that's really interesting because he's not playing like he did when he was with Cleveland, um, where he was an athletic specimen that was pretty raw and despite his size was not great at contested catches, um, but had a great intuition and feel for spacing in the game. Uh, and that's not really how you can play in New England because you have to kind of go according to um, kind of what the offense dictates. Otherwise, you don't have that much um, chemistry with you, with your quarterback. And And I think in this case, um, he is improving every week, so it's very difficult to kind of figure out, you know, what the model for Josh Gordon is. But the avenue of improvement that he's taking is moving him more into kind of this Calvin Johnson territory in terms of his style, where where Johnson had, you know, incredible speed, incredible strength, phenomenal explosiveness, uh, ran like a four three five at two hundred thirty five pounds in someone else's shoes, just a crazy story. Um, and maybe Gordon's not quite that kind of athlete. Maybe he's not quite that talented as Johnson. But the things that separated them uh, from other freak athletes were that they uh, had a, a, a phenomenal understanding of the offense and uh, develop the route running skills in a big way and then also kind of develop the the spatial awareness and understanding to win those contested catches where Gordon wasn't able to do that before. Um, I kind of wish I saw this question earlier so I could ask Brian who he'd compare him to, but I think that when you take into account size, frame, playing style, and the way the trajectory of Josh Gordon uh, and his development inside this offense is going, I think you'll see kind of a similar usage pattern. Whereas before, you could say uh, maybe he's a little bit more Ocho Cinco, maybe a little stronger, um, and, and this time he's kind of more, uh, you know, moving in a Calvin Johnson direction. Next that's question. just a stylistic comparison. Oh yeah. Uh, Caleb Arndt asks, uh, which is the superior New England staple lobster roll or clam chowder? I also should have asked that, but I'm going to go lobster roll. I like clam chowder a lot. It can get kind of old. Uh, and, uh, if you have it too often, um, I have spent a lot of time eating lobster rolls and they've never gotten old. Uh, some of them are not as well made as others, and so the quality can vary. But uh, a good lobster roll is just really hard to beat. See, I, lobster rolls. I've had the uh, I had the best clam chowder of my life at this uh, oddly enough at this restaurant in Vegas, and I don't I don't understand yeah. why that is, but um, just just I'm just going with it at this point. Uh, it was the best I've, I'd ever had, and I've had the best lobster roll I've ever had. And between the two, I really liked the clam chowder more. Which was, There's a higher variance, though, too, right? Like, if you order a clam chowder, I think you're also very likely to get, like, a, a bust, as it were. Whereas with a lobster roll, there's a floor, I think. It's possible. But the uh, as far as, like, the, the ceiling went on that, I was surprised. I was uh, I was really amazed at the, uh, at the uh, specific, like, good, like, amazingness of it, I suppose. Uh, but, yeah, the, the clam chowder was... Like, so, oh, that's like, fair. Uh, like I mean, it was my favorite the table soup. good. It was surprising. <laughs> this is my favorite soup growing up. Maybe I should go back and, and – because it's been a while since I've had a good clam chowder. So I should find more places that have it and order it. Well, the uh, the seafood restaurant in Treasure Island, uh, as of 2013, had the best I've ever had. So okay, well, I'll be sure to make the if trip. If you find yourself at TI, there you go. Uh, next question. Kyle Slaby asks, does Belichick slink over to Thielen after the game, win or lose, and whisper, don't restructure next offseason. I will wait for you. <laughs> um, Be- Belichick is a, a master at communicating with a, a, as few uh, words as possible. So I think he'll just give him a wink and a nod and Thielen's going to – and that also protects Belichick from tampering. So uh, yeah, I Because everyone I think cares about tampering. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think he'll communicate it in as few words as possible, which in this case will be no words, Belichick's favorite amount of words. Uh, and uh, so you're saying it's going to be like it's going to be like Skinner talking to home, talking to Bart Simpson in court. Like I know you can read my thoughts, boy. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I know you can read my thoughts, Adam Thielen. Don't resign. <laughs> don't restructure. Yeah, Fan. but no, it's it's definitely there. Fantastic. Uh, next question. Don from Ohio asks, what can the Vikings incorporate from the Lions when they beat the Pats? Uh, <laughs> That's great. I th- we already have. We already have a running back. Uh, well, first, the the revenge game narrative. I mean, it, you, they should have hired uh, Matt Patricia, right? But <laughs> wow. yeah, I guess, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, the, the running game is going to be a big part of it, beating up the... Uh, Beating up that defensive line and and uh, and and generating uh, an absurd amount of, of carries and yards from from the interior. Uh, I don't know. It's it's not really a, a very similar roster structure. So um, you know, I, I couldn't say that you know do this, don't do that. Um, but uh, you know, it's the the running game kind of got off, and so 
Uh, maybe you can kind of incorporate uh, some of the concepts they use. The problem is that I think the Lions don't use zone nearly as much as the Vikings do. It'd be kind of hard to incorporate all of that. Yeah. Final question, and this is actually going to require some backstory. So this is, you know. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, so last uh, last episode when uh, when Don from Ohio had referenced uh, one of us as the father of a cannibal, I forg- I had no idea what, what was what he was talking about. So I had tweeted out a couple a couple of mornings ago that the oldest uh, kid in my house uh, said aloud in his sleep, I haven't eaten anyone. No. And yeah, I had, there you go. And I had mentioned, now I don't know much <laughs> in this world, but I know that per- that boy has probably eaten a person if you're saying that out loud. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Game of Thrones thing. Any man who, has, who says, I am, you know, I am the king is no king. It's, it's sort of like that. It's like, oh, otherwise, why would you say that out loud with no right, prompting? Right, right. Okay. So this is referring to a question that was asked uh, earlier this year uh, about – a reef committing a horrible crime and me covering up his crimes in order to continue the podcast says, dear James, it turns out your stepson is not a cannibal. He is a serial killer. You watch the show Dexter to find Mm -hmm. out how to stop it at such a young age. You give him a code to live by. If he craves to kill, he kills small animals. It works for a little bit. By, by the time he's 18, he morphs his code to killing bad people such as rapists, murders, etc. Your stepson comes across the uh, the Kyle Slaby tweet about Arifasan being a murderer and takes measures into his own hands. He kidnaps Arif, ties him down to a slab of stone, and is about to kill him when you see this going down in your garage. I like that in this reality I have a house or a garage. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that that's what you attach to in this scenario. Yeah, exactly. By the time he's 18, oh, we got, we got uh, six yes. years. Yeah, okay. Uh, a, do you plead him not to kill a reef and turn him into authorities? B, have him kill a reef and keep all that Patreon money coming in. C, other option. Oh, Patreon money. Hey, I, other option. I'm just happy but I pronounced it correctly old. here. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, props. Um, Patriots. So C, other option. So you could just invent your own solution so long as it's within the bounds of reasonability then. Yeah, within the bounds of reasonability of this question. <laughs> Right. Yeah, in the <laughs> scenario that, that Donna set up. Okay. Well, I'm I'm excited or apprehensive about what your answer is going to be. Boy, do I plead for him not to kill you? Do I have him kill you? And well, see, see, see that's the thing. I'm glad that this is difficult for you. Fantastic. Well, okay, cool. here's the thing: is if I have him kill you, like the Patreon money has to stop. Like, because we're not doing the show anymore, and I have some form of ethics, despite what some people think. Some form of ethics. <laughs> some form of ethics. So that would mean the Patreon money does, in fact, stop. So I think I have to plead for him not to kill a reef. He's not my kid. I'll turn him into the authorities. That's fine. <laughs> not my kid. <laughs> I have a num- <laughs> I have a number of children at my disposal. Losing one, <laughs> that's why you have more kids. That's why you have it, like an X number of kids. Like, oh well, you know, it's it's why the it's why kids you in the lose old one days. To being caught for being a serial killer. Well, at least you got a couple more. Yeah, you got four more. You're this- fine. It's it's why kids back. It's it's why families were so large back in the old days. It's like, well, he's gonna die of dysentery. He's gonna die of let's say yellow fever. But we're still gonna have three more. It'll be fine. He's going to get caught by the FBI. It happens. <laughs> these, these things happen. You cannot plan for this. All you can do is just have as many kids as humanly possible, Maximize apparently. Not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we joked last time about, about, eating the, uh, about eating the tastiest one, and we keep mentioning that to the kids, and they keep arguing over who's the tastiest one. So, eh, whatever. Not my you problem. They became cannibal. Huh. Unusual. Yeah. <laughs> now we're asking how somebody's a cannibal. I have no idea how somebody would get this idea popped into their head. Not a clue. Uh, Reef, what do you got to plug? Uh, yeah, so I wrote a piece at The Athletic about defensive line stunts. I'll have another piece up about how to attack the Patriots uh, or defend against them. Still haven't decided. Probably should. Um, but you can find it over at theathletic.com. Um, but yeah, other than that, read uh, Brian Phillips' stuff. He was uh, engaged, informative, knowledgeable. Should mean uh, some pretty good articles to read, too. Excellent. Well, that is going to be it for this episode. Again, uh, for a reef, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember to tweet that, even if it is a work in progress. And you will hear from us next week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. 
You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out... We hit people in the mouth.